So welcome to the UDLIRN Network and Learn Diving into Meaningful Learning. And uh, just gonna, first of all, if you're here with us, we want to make sure that you know how to get in touch with us. So um, we have a Zoom chat here. If you're joining us on our Zoom, live on our Zoom, please use, please feel free to use the chat. You can um, give a shout out to any of our presenters, comment, um, provide feedback, ask questions. We also, we have uh, Sue Hardin is going to be monitoring the Zoom chat there. So if you have any questions, make sure you get them to Sue and she'll pass them along to our panelists this evening. And then we have Brian Dean be monitoring um, our Twitter feed, the UDLI, hashtag UDLIRN. So if you're hanging out in the, in the Twitter feed there, you can uh, tweet out your questions, your comments there, and Brian will relay those on to us. And um, also live on YouTube, we'll be live streaming. So you can check us out there and somewhere in our chat and on Twitter, we should have that YouTube live streaming link. So you can come and join us there too, all kinds of ways to get in touch. Uh, tonight, as we get started, we're just to give you a little setup of what we're going to be doing. We're going to have our, our, some of our panelists kind of set the stage. They're going to introduce themselves, tell a little bit about their UDL story, their journeys, uh, you know, what they're going to be bringing to, to our conversations tonight. We'll have a great discussion with those panelists, and then we're going to have a little audience question and answer at the end. So make sure you're sharing your questions as we go along um, or, or write them down and save them for the end and we'll, uh, we'll get those out to our panelists. So without further ado, I want to introduce tonight's facilitators. Uh, we have Sue Hardin, like I mentioned before, she's our UDL IRN Board of Directors and Assistive Technology and UDL Coordinator for Macomb ISD in Michigan. We also have Brian Dean. Brian Dean, now the safe uterus. <laughs> For Northern Ivel. It's a very, very fancy title, Brian. I really like that. So I did I didn't choose it. I didn't choose a career, and I feel like I have to say that. <laughs> I, I don't I think I feel like it chose you though. I think that that is uh, good. very good. It's, it's very absolutely good. the perfect title for you. So uh, Brian Dean will be monitoring our Twitter chat. And then we also um, and then myself, Karen Howard, I'm an assistive technology consultant and uh, and UDL enthusiast, I guess I'll say, from Muskegon area ISD. And uh, so tonight, our panelists, we are um, really honored to have Dr. Luis Perez here. He's a co-author of Dive Into UDL, um, Learning on the Go presenter, uh, the AIM Center Technical Assistance Specialist, just lots and lots of experience with UDL and accessibility. So. Um, Dr. Luis Perez will be here, is here with us today, as well as Kendra Grant, another co-author of Dive Into UDL and educator and presenter. So we'll be hearing a little bit more from them in just a moment. Um, and then we'll also have Helen Dwarf, who is the Faculty of Education, um, I'm sorry, Faculty of Education for Lakehead University in Ontario, Canada. And um, she'll talk a little bit about how she has facilitated some uh, really impressive UDL learning and online environment through um, this key. And then as well as Tom Hinkin. Tom Hinkin is a social studies consultant and a UDL professional learning facilitator with Muskegon ISD. So we'll, we're going to turn it over to them in just a moment. I'll let them introduce themselves um, a little bit more. And uh, maybe I'll just head over just for a second to... Um, to uh, Luis and Kendra, if you guys want to just chime in, introduce yourselves, just talk a little, maybe provide a little bit of background on who you are and um, why you're here. What's your what's your UDL journey? How did you come to UDL? You want me to go sure. first, Luis? Sure, I'll go for it, Kendra. You'll, you'll have a longer story probably than me. <laughs> oh, you never know. I might give you the short edition tonight. <laughs> So I was a, an educator here in Ontario, Canada for about 25 years and my background was in uh, library and special education and I started back in assistive technology back in the late 90s when the Kurzweil tools first came out and I really felt like this was going to change the way kids learn. So for me, the my background has always been in education, but then I went into the business end of things. Uh, and have my own PD company. And you'll see how these two things kind of come together in the book. And that was I uh, was in Portland, Oregon, and we did PD around and 
technology um, and how to actually put it into your pedagogy rather than this extra thing or, or clicking on tools and those kinds of training and really bringing it into your classroom. Um, and so those sorts of things came together and I always had universal design for learning was always a big part of that. Um, currently right now I actually work in adult education and so UDL for me um, is something that I want to bring to the adult learning space as well in corporate environments. Um, and I looked at your question about my UDL journey and it was I thought it was really interesting. I actually was a teacher librarian, it was uh, 2004 and I read teaching every uh, student in the digital age and that was kind of for me that aha book that really was what I was trying to do in the classroom and in that school we had um, about 60 languages represented um, we had uh, kids who would come to the school and when we'd ask their parents how long have you been in Canada they would said look at their watch and go 10 hours um, so we had all these really diverse learners coming together and for me that book came right at the right time where we really wanted to do something different with the technology. It was just starting to really be able to be robust and something that the kids could use. And that's really where it started for me was uh, as a teacher librarian and bringing that to all of the people in our school at a very rudimentary level. Now that I look back, um, you know, I was only waiting in, but it still made a real difference in kids' lives. Yeah, love to hear that, but really whole full circle. So from, you know, experience it from that teacher's perspective and then into product design and development and then now back to teaching others about it. That's, that's, um, it's a very diverse and uh, comprehensive, I guess, community all experience there. Very cool. Luis, how about you? Well, first of all, I want to highlight that this is a binational panel tonight. Mm -hmm. We have a couple of representatives from uh, Canada and then a few of us from the US. So uh, it shows you that, you know, it's, um, we can collaborate across borders. So it's really exciting to, to see that. Uh, my UDL journey is pretty interesting because um, I didn't intend to be an educator. Um, my college degree is in political science. I'm a political scientist by trade. And actually after college, um, I taught for a year um, as a Spanish teacher and it did not go so well. So I decided to leave education for a little bit and went to work as an immigrant rights advocate uh, for a number of years for a nonprofit, an NGO. And um, it turns out we were doing a lot of education, just different types of education. <laughs> uh, so education didn't really leave me, if you will. It's just that I was in a different setting. And around that time, this thing called the internet was catching on. And so I became really interested in that and started doing some web design work, web development. And that's, um, as I say, the universe has a weird way of working out because um, I started learning about accessibility, not um, as a professional uh, consideration of, you know, the websites that I was designing, I needed to consider accessibility um, for those. And a few years later, I was diagnosed with a visual impairment so what was a professional um, consideration now became a very personal uh, thing that I needed to think about. And so that really ignited my fire, if you will, to go back to school and uh, get a degree. So I got a degree as an instructional designer and uh, did a lot of work around uh, teacher preparation, um, pre worked with pre-service teachers and in technology integration and uh, then kind of moved on from there and started looking more at the assistive technology and the universal design for learning. And so that's where I've been for you know about the last 10 years or so. Um, it's really doing a lot of consultation around assistive technology, accessibility features. Um, and then today I'm at the uh, National AIM Center where we promote you know, high quality um, accessible educational materials uh, across the lifespan. So traditionally we worked with K-12, but uh, our mission has expanded to include higher education and the workforce. Uh, so we like to say that, you know, from twinkles to wrinkles, we got you covered when it comes to accessible educational materials and technologies. I, I love that. I think that's, that's the best tagline I've heard in quite some time. That's fantastic. Yeah. Twinkles to wrinkles. It so. sounds better than womb to tomb. I think. <laughs> <laughs> agreed. Agreed. <laughs> 
for sure. All right. Thank you both very much. Um, be, before we go into a little bit more about your journey, um, I'd like to, and in, in, in this amazing book that you've done, and um, I'd like to introduce or have them introduce themselves. Um, first, Helen, would you mind just tell, tell us a little bit about who you are and your, your journey into UDL? Sure. Um, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk about the book study that uh, I've coordinated with um, ISTE ILN network. Um, so my passion, my, my uh, UDL journey really comes or stems from my classroom teaching experience, my work as an educator, special education resource, computer lab instruction way back when computer labs were the, were the way to, to teach. And now at the Faculty of Education, as I work with um, pre-service teachers in, in their struggles to, to find and figure out how to, to make things really work for their, for their students as they go into the classrooms. So um, I'm relatively new to the, the terminology and the framework with UDL, but I've been teaching from a, a UDL um, kind of environment as, as I've done all of the teaching that I've done over the course of the years. So it's nice to have this framework to build and structure things around and, and really make sure that um, I'm opening all of the opportunities and all of the doors that are available for students. Um, and I think I'll just mention that the connection for Luis and Kendra and I really stemmed from a, a, a small um, supportive open online course that they did a number of years back called the SOOC and I was interested in dipping into um, computer apps at the time and just came across randomly serendipitously came across the SOOC and participated with them um, in learning more about UDL and computer apps so that's where we've connected and uh, I guess grown since Fantastic, fantastic. What a, a fortuitous connection to make right there for, for all involved. And um, Tom, do you mind just introducing yourself a little bit and talking a little bit about um, your UDL background and how, how you got where you are in your UDL journey? Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, so uh, I'm a social studies consultant at the Muskegon ISD. Uh, it's a new gig. I spent a little over 20 years teaching, uh, first, fifth grade, and then seventh grade. The UDL journey started for me, I think, three years ago or so when the Muskegon ISD, Corinne and some others, started a push and asked uh, people to come in from around the county. We'd meet in the evenings, have dinner and dialogue. Um, I kind of fell in love with it because I saw it as a way to reach a lot of the kids that traditionally we were not reaching. Um, after that, I practiced it for a year in my room. Um, then uh, last year, I led a team in our middle school uh, with some success. Uh, this year, I'm, I'm still leading the team at the middle school. Uh, we have two teams there now. Everybody in the school is on one of the two teams. So it's a school-wide push. Um, and as a social studies consultant, now I kind of like it because when I go work with other teachers, I can use UDL as a lens. Um, to offer ways for them to help their students. So uh, I'm really glad to be here tonight. Fantastic, thank you all so much for taking the time to do that. I love um, the diversity of this panel and, and Luis uh, pointed out this, well, not even just from uh, uh, you know international sort of a standpoint, but we have um, really people of all different who came at UDL or came to UDL from such a variety of perspectives and backgrounds. Um, and I think it's, it really says something about um, how throughout, you know, it kind of really stands the test of time and uh, environment and languages that it really is this framework that's, that can be really uniting and, um, and meaningful to a lot of different people. So um, pretty cool. So I'm going to, I'd like to just start with, I have a few questions as we get started. Um, a few questions for Luis and Kendra, if you guys don't mind starting, just tell us a little bit. So we, we have this, this new book, uh, Dive Into UDL, which um, I happened to pick up off the presses and it came out and um, 
really, really enjoyed it. And we're, uh, we're diving into that book along with some other resources with a, with a couple of different groups um, that in our county who are facilitating UDL uh, learning around. But tell us a little bit about this new book of yours and with all the possible topics that you guys have uh, <laughs> are passionate about, which is, is more than a few, um, why UDL and how did, how did you come to partner together around this? Well, I, I can tell you how uh, we came to partner together is uh, through the, it's the Inclusive Learning Network. Uh, so I'm the current president um, and I've had a number of roles within the ISTE Inclusive Learning Network. Um, I was professional learning chair, vice president, and now president. And then Kendra has been uh, one of our president as well. And she's done professional learning. So we are uh, partners in crime. We've traveled around the world. Um, I don't know if you remember Kendra getting lost in Poland and going wow. around the same block a few times because we couldn't find where our hotel was. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> we've, we've had all kinds of fun traveling around the world, but really um, I think um, there are a couple of things that kind of uh, gave rise to this book. One was the souk that uh, Helen already mentioned. That's something that Kendra, myself and uh, another colleague of ours, uh, Elizabeth Dalton, the three of us uh, developed um, and pilot it for the ISTE Inclusive Learning Network. Uh, so if you're familiar with the MOOC, right, a massive online, open online course, uh, the SOOC was a variation of that, but a much smaller community. It was community of practice model, and then uh, with lots of supports built in. And so Helen can tell you a little bit from her side of it, what that was like. But uh, what was interesting about the SOOC is we were participating in it, not just as instructors, we were actually completing all the assignments and submitting our thoughts and um, you know sharing our artifacts and our thinking uh, right along with everybody else. So it was it was kind of a different model. And so we uh, collected some data based on that, and then we published a um, book chapter and uh, an article that was published in uh, CSUN's journal. And so um, that was kind of the the background for the book. But really, what motivated us to write it is. Um, I don't know if you remember this, Kendra, but the two of us were at a booth at the ISTE conference a few years ago in Philadelphia. And we were kind of giving our spiel to this person about what we do as the ISTE Inclusive Learning Network. Yeah. And this educator said, I don't have any of those students in my classroom. <laughs> and so that, that kind of was a wake up call, like because we've been doing this work in some way, sort of preaching to the choir Right. And so it just kind of highlighted to us that we needed to step away and kind of reach out to these new audiences, um, the general education audience that typically goes to conferences like ISTE and make them aware of, you know, what a rich framework UDL is and what it has to offer to them. Um, and then um, I also thought by like um, the fact that it's ISTE and people have, um, they already have a pretty strong background in technology that we could make a connection between um, you know, UDL and the ISTE standards and how the ISTE standards support ownership and variability now, uh, thanks to the efforts of um, people like our colleagues, um, Mindy Johnson from CAS, uh, who has been part of ISTE for quite some time. So I, thought, I just thought the time was right to kind of expand UDL be beyond a core audience and look at a place like ISTE and try to bring more people into our tent, if you will. So Kendra, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I, I was going to say in the soup, what we try to do is give people all those options and choice. So we modeled UDL in, in it. But even when I analyzed some of the, the data that came in, we did have people who still were like, well, I didn't participate. I watched and I learned a lot, but I was like too afraid because I wasn't like an expert. I wasn't good enough at it. And although other people saw us and went, we realized that you weren't the only expert. We had other people who could be experts. But it was interesting to me, those people who still kind of struggled with it. So that was part of the design around um, the book was, you know, uh, it's this um, idea that you have to be this expert before you can do UDL, or you have to do all of it. And if you don't do all of it, you know, you must be doing something wrong. And so for me, it was really about, like I said, when I first started, I was really waiting in, thought I was doing it all. But the point is even a little bit of change is going to help learners. And so that was really for me, uh, the book kind of modeling that. And the other piece was 
came from my role as having my own company. And a lot of times when I traveled around to different um, districts, a lot of times teachers would say, tell me what to do. Give me the program. And, and I'm not quite sure where that came from, but part of it I thought was about owning your own professional learning and being um, not having someone tell you what you should learn or come to this and we're gonna tell you what steps to take in order to be a good teacher. So that idea of owning your own professional learning was that other piece that, uh, that for me was an important part of the book. And I know Louise, um, I know we had um, interesting discussions with our editor and you about putting that part first and not talking about UDL until it kind of comes later in the book. But for me, it's kind of framing your that learning um, yourself that you're a learner. Um, and until you do that, you know, you're not really going to perhaps bring as much as you can if you're not showing the students that you're a learner. So that was kind of that, the piece of it where I brought the two together. Um, and I think the other piece, so for Louise, for partnering was also, I remember when we had an ISD, our, our um, inclusive learning network, we had those meetings where we all came together at the end of ISTE. And I remember this guy coming and kind of challenging us a little bit, very <laughs> politely, very politely on the inclusive piece and did we have these things happening and I went okay this guy's going to change some things and I think right from there we kind of hit it off and uh, we did a playground where we had nine videos that looked at each of the guidelines and it was for me it was kind of like that's cool but it's not quite it so I think that's when we really started talking about what else could we do to help people understand UDL and not see them as compartmentalized things, but in fact, this kind of this framework that they could use. Yeah, and the, and the, the title, uh, Dive Into UDL, it's, it's kind of interesting how that came about because um, I had just seen uh, Michael Phelps' uh, mom speak at a conference. And so swimming was kind of in my brain. And when we did our proposal, um, that was a big part of chapter one is an interview that uh, Michael Phelps' mom did where she talks about some of the strategies that she used with Michael because Michael has um, ADHD and how that was really helpful uh, for him with learning math and other subjects. Um, and so that idea was kind of floating around in my head and then Kendra and I kind of talked about it and then that's where the idea of, you know, there's different entry points with UDL. So you don't have to be yourself as uh, somebody who's practicing UDL, be an expert all at once, as Kendra said. You can kind of dip your toes, you can go for a shallow swim with a little bit of support, and then when you're ready for it, you can sort of take a deep dive. And so we wanted to sort of mirror that in the design of the book, but we were somewhat limited by print. <laughs> and we've probably heard this a lot of times if you've been around UDL, you know, sometimes print can be the disabling factor. And so um, we wanted to create something that was really sort of um, dynamic where you could almost like uh, choose your own story, choose your own ending, your own path kind of um, resource. But unfortunately with print that is kind of difficult to do. So we were able to do that in some ways by being creative, but that's where the companion website comes in as well, because we, we found out that, you know, for instance, the images wouldn't be accessible to everybody. Uh, and so on the website, you'll find the images, um, they're much bigger, and then there are accessibility descriptions for all of the images. Um, and the same thing with the videos, it's just not the same when you're seeing a screenshot of a video, or even with a, a QR code. Um, that's one way that you could, you know, make the video more accessible, but we wanted to make sure that it had captions and so on. So again, we try to combine the best of what print has to offer and the best of what digital has to offer and uh, leverage those two. Right, so, and you, you talked a little bit, um, Luis and Kendra, you were talking a little bit about that, that concept of making everybody feel, having everyone have a, a kind of a comfortable entry point um, into the book. So you talk a little bit about the, the dipping your toe in the, you know, the wading in the swimming and then the, the deep dive. Um, so can you describe, uh, in just in a, in a sentence or two, like, well, what, what does that look like as someone enters the book? How do they, how do they interact with each of those se sections? How do they, they make a decision about where to, where to jump in? Through formative assessment. <laughs> so right at the get-go, there is a small assessment that you can take. 
And based on your responses to that, then you can sort of get some guidance on which level you can uh, proceed through the book. And then as you go through it, there's, again, those different levels are reinforced again. Um, so that that's a, a big part of it. And then I see here um, you have linked your um, the the website for the book of the in the companion yep. website. Do you want me to link pop out to either one of those? To, is there something specific you wanted to to show the audience tonight about those? Sure. Yeah, you could you could do the the website. Okay. Yeah, that one. Yeah. So just to give a little flavor for that exactly what you were talking about, really. Yeah. Um, going beyond the print, like you said, going beyond the limitations of the print. So this is the companion website that you've developed to help um, really deepen the, the experience. Right. So if you go to the top or even there, you'll see the link, UDL self-assessment. So you can complete that. And then based on your responses, then you'll you pick, you know, for each uh, chapter, you'll see that there is a sort of dip your toes shallow swim and deep dive level. And we, de we describe those as well. But again, it could be that, you know, you, you don't have to do that. It's just one way of taking a look at maybe some of your understanding and gives you a, a starting place. We talk a little bit about that there as well. Um, you'll also notice that we, uh, Luis mentioned the book images are over one from the assessment. So those are, I like to do, um, I like visual things and uh, they're not always like Louise said again, they're not always accessible in a book. So we did put them in here, um, but we also created new ones for the website. So the website is actually, um, I might've gone pushed a little harder on some of my language in, uh, in terms of what I really believe in, in the uh, website, but did a summary throughout the, um, so if you go up to the top, you'll just see uh, we have part one and it has, if you look, click on that, um, you'll be able to just see kind of the basis of each of these pages. It just gives a little bit of an overview. I try to do some kind of a thoughtful um, quote that you might use if you're trying to convince someone of why they might use it. And then we talk a little bit about starting where you are. And then it has the chapter one, two, and three at the bottom. So it kind of starts the sets off that first section of what you can do. Um, and then each chapter uh, actually has, and I think I had chapter three wasn't working for me. So hopefully my links are working here. Well, sometimes we have to go back in and fix it. If it's not, you can go to the top and take a look. Um, and then in that we have, um, yeah, maybe we'll go up to the top for, yeah, that's perfect. And then if you scroll down, you'll see uh, uh, where you have some other activities that you yourself could use. You just keep scrolling right down, keep going and keep going. And there we go. So when you, you can actually do some other activities here, um, wade in, shallow swim in a deep dive. And we're always looking for other resources. So if you have suggestions of things, but you could use this for your own learning, or if you're working with a group, you might want to come in and take a look at, a, at something in here. And again, it really doesn't matter if you go stick with the wade in, shallow swim, deep dive, but it's just some resources to help you think and expand further on what you've read in the book. Absolutely. Um, excellent, thank you for, help, for walking us through that companion website. I think that helps to give a little bit of a a um, little better idea of exactly what that was, how you created that to help reinforce and expand and deepen the, the learning that goes along with that book. Um, so obviously this, we really wanted to, to feature this as an example of how to, um, how you could get the most out of some leading some UDL learning through a book study. There's, there's always those challenges. I want to uh, open up the next question, set of questions to all of our panelists for tonight. For tonight. But um, I know uh, as, we, um, as we start to lead, as I've, I've led some uh, professional learning around universal design for learning, and as adults, uh, adults are so comfortable with a book study. It feels like a safe place to start. Often that's the first thing that, that people run to, or particularly if you're trying to connect over distances and 
Um, you have a set amount of, you know, set times to meet and uh, some time parameters and other constraints. Um, you don't, you, you need something to really to ground your time together well and make it organized and so people gravitate towards a book. But there are some inherent, inherent challenges with um, leading UDL learning through something that can be as static as, as a book study. So um, first of all, to anyone, any, any one of you can, can chime in a little bit. Um, what are some of the, the, the barriers you've come across in leading adult learning around universal design for learning, specifically maybe through a book study or, or maybe just in general? Um, anybody want to talk to that? I can jump in if that's okay. Absolutely. <laughs> since, since I've organized the uh, book study for the last three years for the uh, ISD ILN um, Inclusive Learning Network, it's uh, so one of the barriers obviously is the amount of time that people have and and feeling like they can accomplish something within a book study. So making uh, um, book study activities um, engaging in some way, hooking their interest, um, having a bit of fun together to make it uh, more engaging um, and to make sure that there's there's that opportunity to have rich or deep conversations with other people about specific topics. Um, and a barrier to that is whether you're organizing it synchronously. So you have to meet in the same place at the same time at a, at a coffee shop, for example, or at a school classroom, for example, or whether you go to an online um, forum the way we've done with the book studies for the Inclusive Learning Network. Um, scheduling it and making sure that um, you have a plan and people know when it ends. So we plan ours, we tend to plan ours for four weeks, for example, and each week has a different activity or a different focus, um, kind of working your way through the, the whole book or parts of the book, um, giving people permission to only read what they can accomplish to read and not read every page or every piece of the text that's there, but to engage with something that they do that catches their attention and, and catches their interest. Um, and I think one of the other challenges that a lot of adults tend to be more concerned about their, um, uh, their, their presence and making sure that they're not um, looking silly or, or feeling like they don't know something. We, you know, Kendra's mentioned that a little bit already, that there's a place and a space for everybody to have a voice in the conversations in some way. And I think that's an important piece to keep emphasizing. And um, with each of the weeks, I was sending out a weekly email just to keep everybody on track. Here's what you do next. Here's what you can try. Um, with the dive into UDL, we structured the book study the same way that the book is with the, you know, the, the toe in, the, the wade in, the shallow swim, or the dive in. So we had a variety of different activities that they could engage in. So I think that's an important um, sort of positive piece as well. So thank you, thank you, Helen. So Helen, one of the things that you you just mentioned, and like and referencing back to what Kendra said earlier, is just making people feel comfortable, and feeling um, that you don't need to be an expert in this. You don't need to have all the answers. Um, so helping people find a, a an entry point that's comfortable for them to jump in um, to the learning without having to maybe, like you said. Uh, divulge the, the entire text, um, you know, take in what's comfortable for them and get what they can out of it. And, um, and the other piece is uh, 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 for both of the book studies that we've done with UDL as a focus is um, different opportunities that are both, you know, physical in your hands or digital. So that, you know, whatever your style or whatever fits your needs um, is available. And it, I think we lost you a, a little bit there, Helen. What was the last comment that you made? Fill, fitting the needs of the participants. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, if I could add, um, I think that's what one of the things that was so powerful about the souk, as I mentioned, is that um, 
I think we need to be vulnerable to um, instead of creating this sort of like I'm the expert and you're all here to get information from me. Instead of doing that, maybe creating a dynamic where it's more we're kind of creating a new meaning, new knowledge together. And so um, that's what we try to model in the souk is that that's one of the reasons why we were participants as well, so that we could share, you know, we're learning ourselves, we're vulnerable, um, we don't have all the answers here. And so we're going to make mistakes as well um, with regard to accessibility or whatever it may be. And we're a community. We're going to learn as a community. Um, so, so that's important too, too I think. Um, the other thing I would add is that um, just sort of having a social space is important too because um, within adult learning, we sometimes underestimate the need to have fun and to just connect on sort of a social level. So social presence um, is important as well. Um, so whether it's creating sort of a separate discussion area where people just share social things like movies or whatever that's completely unrelated to the course content. But again, the goal there is to build community and to get people to open up to each other and be comfortable with each other. And you may not think that that's going to have an impact on learning, but if people know each other better, I think it will, especially when we're in a space where it's sort of impersonal to begin with, right? Because we're not always seeing each other. We're just seeing what we type. Um, so I, I can't um, emphasize, you know, overemphasize that. The social component of learning is important. Uh, just yeah. piggybacking on that with, uh, we use the term, the rotating more knowledgeable other. It's in chapter three on the, on the website. Um, and that idea that, you know, the more knowledgeable other, obviously by Gatsby, but the idea that we can do that as well, that we can kind of uh, step up at times and other times we learn from others. And I think trying to see, have everyone see that they have something to contribute and something to learn was really a big part of our souk and was really a big part of what we did in the book as well. So it's uh, it's interesting here as I, I'm, um, oh, and I think we may have lost, oh, I can't grab that. Um, as, I, as I'm making some some notes here about some of these comments, I'm seeing some themes come up through. We talked, talking about uh, collaboration and community and uh, ensuring like that safety and that people feel safe in this and that they feel connected um, and really making sure that what's being, um, the, the learning that's being offered is, is relevant and authentic to them. So those are some themes that, that seem, uh, seem familiar within the, within the framework. Isn't that funny how that, that <laughs> fits our adult learning styles as well, yes? Or, our, uh, our adult learning needs, I should say. Um, absolutely, very good point. So this that's kind of starts to lead into a next question I have um, for, for anyone who'd like to join in, which is um, if you're designing an ideal UDL book study, so as ideal as it, as it can be to, to lead some UDL learning through a book study, um, what would be two or three key considerations, and maybe you've already touched on some of them, but anybody else have any other key considerations that you would keep in mind? I'll start with one that I know Kendra and Louise will say to use UDL to learn about UDL. Yep. So Helen, can you talk a, a little bit more about that? Like how, how have, what has that looked like in some of the, um, the professional learning you facilitated? For example, multiple means of, of action and, and expression. So offering a, a variety of different activities that people can engage in um, to feel like they've participated. Um, if you're not comfortable with video, then do an audio recording. If you're not comfortable with digital media, then do a paper meme, for example, and take a picture of it and post that to Twitter, to a slow chat in Twitter, for example. Um, just adding text to something as, as unthreatening as, as Answer Garden. Um, in VoiceThread, if, you're, if you don't wanna put your, your face into it, put an avatar image in. So uh, offering a, a variety of ways to represent 
what you know, a variety of ways to engage with others. Um, so I guess uh, use UDL principles to learn. Um, I'd say piggybacking on that would also be, and we did this in our SOUC, two things we did, I think. One was we, we had them, they had to do um, represent their ideas in two different ways because people tend to, teachers, somewhat stereotypical, but teachers tend to like text. So we had them do it in, in um, different ways. Um, and then I'm losing my other thought there. Um, oh, and then we had the reflection piece. So it was like, when you did something, then there was a reflection around how might this support you as a learner? How would it support your, your uh, students in your classroom? You know, what did this do? What did it make you think of? All of those sorts of metacognitive sorts pieces, I think were really important um, rather than just having them post, but actually have them reflect on their practice and their learning. And um, the only thing I would add too is uh, within the book and you know, the, the way that the guidelines have been sort of reframed uh, around three different stages, right? Of access, build and internalize. Uh, we definitely wanted to emphasize that in the book and we wanted to give a prominent role to accessibility because I feel like a lot of times um, UDL practitioners, uh, they, may, you know, they may buy into that idea of providing voice and choice but I always say, if none of those choices are accessible, then how much choice are you really providing, right? So um, it's important for us to emphasize that. And it's not, we're not gonna be perfect. So that's the other thing is perfect sometimes is the enemy of doing better. So um, we try to emphasize that, uh, you know, at least think about accessibility when you consider any of these uh, tools like VoiceThread. So think about how might that not work for some people, right? Um, how would you use it if you couldn't see and things like that? So uh, keeping accessibility in mind is something that is essential, but we know it's not enough, right? But it is the foundation upon which um, a lot of those choices uh, rest. So we need to consider that from the start. Absolutely. It's, um, yeah, hard, hard to have choice when the choices aren't, um, aren't accessible to you and, and definitely keeping in mind that's the that, that has to be the entry point for our our uh, UDL um, frame, making sure ensuring at the at the very minimum that things are accessible for our audience. Yeah, um, sorry to cut in, but uh, we're actually using the book with uh, our middle school teachers, and they identified engagement. They wanted to increase student engagement and the accessibility. Um, one of the quotes that the teachers picked out was accessibility and motivation, the link between accessibility and motivation. Kids can't be motivated and engaged if the content's not accessible to them. So that was just something that really stuck out to all of the teachers in our groups. That's, that's great to hear. I mean, yeah. it, it's sort of like uh, trauma, right? A kid who has experienced trauma, they may not be in a position to learn. So think about a learner who's frustrated because they can't access the text or they can't access those videos. Uh, let's say that they can't, um, you know, they're having difficulty hearing and they, they can't access the content in the video without captions. Well, that frustration is gonna have an impact on your motivation for learning. And at some point, you know, you can only take so much frustration before you shut down. And we may see that in ways that, you know, we think are behavior issues, <laughs> right. but there is a learning component to those behavior issues too, sometimes. Yeah, we actually used the, your online supplement, the disability simulator and things like that from chapter five. Uh, we did that at the beginning of our lesson. Um, and then we watched the teachers get super frustrated and get really fight it all, fight about it. You know, just <laughs> you see how, how difficult it was for them and for myself as well. So that kind of led into the accessibility and the motivation too. So it was a great connection, those two things together. Great. So Tom, since you're talking a little bit about uh, the learning that you're helping to lead, um, around UDL and you guys are doing this partly through, uh, through the, the book study and using the companion website along with other Can you talk a little bit more about what that other, the other components now you, you have the, um, 
the fortune to be able to be face to face with these with these teachers and physically present with them um, in their buildings and sometimes so from that perspective what else are you able to bring um, to that that learning experience well i thought it was interesting um some of the things you said were important for the online uh people being comfortable feeling safe um are so important there as well and building the the community even though we are face to face and we're a small group um and i know the teachers really well but still this the udl is um it can be kind of seen as threatening i guess it's it's a difficult thing to take take a chunk of so uh, we've been really intentional about building community and um trying to make sure that we all know that we're we're learning together and myself and the other coach are not experts. We're learning with them. Um, so we've just kind of offered things like, you know, coming into classrooms with them, observing each other. Um, we've got a Google classroom and a Google site where we just share information out. Um, and I'm really trying to encourage on-site coaches um, so they can be like on demand or on call if somebody needs them right away, rather than me trying to coach from the ISD. Absolutely. So creating that, that safety, that um, building community and safety uh, and collaboration, even face-to-face -face is, is something that we definitely need to, to make sure that we're taking into consideration. Yeah, and, definitely. Um, and having that just in time Kind of and, support. And, uh, Helen talked a little bit about that, but in between the book studies, like continuing to keep touching base and keeping in in, in contact. And Luis mm -hmm. talked about that too, that social presence, having that that constant kind of contact in between those formal meetings. And and then uh, assuming that that coach, that on-site coach, would help support in a similar similar way. That um, you know, day to day or at least week to week kind of contact and and nudge and, and support in between those more formal learning sessions. Um, okay, since we're, we're getting close to our, our end time, nine o'clock here, I'm gonna turn it over to, um, let's see, I'm gonna go through here. We talked a little bit about our key considerations. We talked about some examples in action, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn this over to our audience now to see who might have some questions. So. Sue and Brian, um, if you guys have any questions, I, we'd love to hear from our audience today. If you can chat those out in our Zoom chat or tweet them out on the hashtag UDLIRN. Anybody have any questions um, right now for any of our panelists? You wanna, you wanna go first, Sue? I got a couple here on Twitter, but I, I, I always, of course, ladies first. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Um, you know what? Why don't you go ahead and I'll come back in. I have one one question um, at the end. I'll, I'll go ahead and ask that if you want to just go ahead and go. Yeah, jump. for sure. So one of the things that's really amazing about the book, I, of course, you know, Kendra, uh, Louise, you guys know that I'm a huge fan of and, and, and not just a fan of your UDL work, but Louise, your, your hat game's on point too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like cooler than the other side of the pillow. But one of the big things that really strikes me about this book and struck some people on, on, on Twitter about this book is just the depth of design that you have intentionally put into this book. And so one of the big questions that comes up is like, how did you keep all of those pieces straight and moving forward, especially when considering that, that you're trying to build a book study, which is another set of intentional design questions on top of this already kind of fluid design system that you you both kind of built into the book. That That is a good question, Brian. How do we keep it together? <laughs> <laughs> well, part of it, um, we actually, um, to be honest with you, we kind of actually brought our editor into a new process. Um, our editor was familiar with tools like Microsoft Word and wanted to send things back and forth. And we were like, um, there's a better way to do that. We can just do Google Docs and we can sort of work. We can all be in the same document and provide each other comments and see revisions and so on. And we thought that also mirrored more of a UDL uh, mm -hmm. workflow, if you will, of sort yeah. of putting together a book in real time with feedback, um, 
you know, we could see what we had written before and compare things and see, oh, that doesn't make sense or that doesn't work out as well. So I feel like our editor benefited from this process as well. <laughs> so, well, you, you know, it's so interesting to me because really like what you're getting at is this deep level of understanding around UDL that there is fluidity within it, right? And that it is, and you even said yourself, you're not gonna do it perfect. And sometimes perfect is, is the enemy, right? And, and, and I, I think that that's just such a powerful takeaway yet your book is so brilliantly designed, in my opinion, just just unlike a lot of things that I had seen, um, that it seems like like it is all very intentional. But even within that intentionality, there's this flexibility. It's 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 amazing. It's amazing. And so I wonder, you know, when we're trying to put together book studies, that makes it you know, that makes it very complicated. Uh, thank you for that. That's uh... A, a real compliment and it's sometimes hard to take compliments from from as educators so thank you um when when i put in the um the proposal i have to say i actually used um inspiration software anybody got a shout out for inspiration um and because it has uh the way i like to see things is a visual design if anybody remembers that software uh, and then it turns into a written outline so you're able to move your ideas around you know visually on a page and color code and do those sorts of things um that was really one of the the starting points for me was to kind of just get those ideas out and um i think then for Luis and i you know we had those big discussions around what comes first and uh, you know i think the traditional approach would have been we'll tell them all about udl first this is a udl book um and i think our goal was really to start framing their learning and i think that the assumption piece you know your assumptions and beliefs was a, a really big part i think we don't really start talking about udl really until about what fifth chapter right. um and so that was really a big piece of it as well, was um, just allowing people to maybe take a different approach to it rather than just diving in. And I think for me, I remember I did, I was in San Diego Unified and cast came in and um, even sometimes it was just so much information um, and jumping right into the heart of it that I was like, you know, oh my gosh, I can't really process this. So that was another piece for me was just kind of letting people slowly get in, um, but maybe approaching it from a different way than, than has typically happened. I, I would add to that, um, having written a book by myself before this one, mm -hmm. that I think what makes this book really powerful is the, the partnership. Yeah. And it's, um, it's, it's a better book, not because Kendra wrote it or because Louise wrote it, but because we wrote it together. Um, Kendra is, um, you know, all those wonderful visuals you see in the book, that's a talent that Kendra has, a different yeah. way of looking at the world visually and getting ideas that way. That does not work for me for <laughs> reasons of I'm visually impaired. Sure, sure. Um, And I have a more sort of linear way of thinking um, and just different way of, you know, viewing the world. But I think the two of us together uh, make a powerful team. So when we look at um, you know, implementing UDL in the classroom, don't feel like as a single person, you're going to sort of get everything right that there is with UDL, but maybe as a team and following that coaching approach that Tom mentioned earlier, uh, working together, you can kind of balance each other out and bring in different ideas and so on. And, and it's gonna be like one of those situations where the, the sum is greater than the parts really. Yeah, that's that's the ultimate idea, that idea of synergy, right? Yep. Being able to add all of those things that are really unique and building something really wonderful from them. Uh, and I think that you've hit it on the head with this book. And I think that book studies have a lot to learn from that, right? And professional development have a lot to learn from that, just just in that structuring. It's, it's really great. The other question I had is uh, that came up was, uh, you know, we've mentioned a lot of technology-based tools. And, and, and there's times that we have to be cautious about that with UDL, right? Because there, there's the myth that UDL exists only with technology. So if on your website or someplace else, is there a listing of how like some other tools that you would use that wouldn't necessarily be technology-based like VoiceThread or, or any of those um, to help facilitate some, some book studies or professional development? Yeah, we, we, we had some listed on one of those screens. If you go back a couple of screens, 
uh, that would be helpful. And we can mention them out loud too. Absolutely. So Helen, do you want to talk to through? Oh, there we go. Some of these here. Um, Answer Garden. Is Helen still with us? I, yeah, don't see I oh. am. Yes, I am. <laughs> Answer Garden is a crowdsourcing word cloud. Um, it's a nice way to have everyone participate in some way and really uh, gain sort of like a, a, a vision of what key ideas or key words would come out of a, a group of people, for example. It's a really nice um, anonymous tool. So there's a low barrier to participation for that. Um, the one activity that, we re that I really enjoyed was the collaborative journaling. So the Google Doc uh, was set up with specific blocks where everybody could put in comments or um, um, ahas or, or you know, quotes from the book and then added a comment to it. So we had these domino comments happening. So it was, a, it was an engaging conversation. Uh, Twitter slow chats I like because again, they're low barrier. You, you tweet once and you're done or you can tweet successively and really uh, engage and participate. So those are, are different ways to get people involved. Um, the, the uh, but, but again, but again, those are all technology based, oh, right? So, and, uh, right. So that's so, yeah. so I'm wondering if you have a set of protocols or routines or, or pieces like that, that you would think uh, would not necessarily be that you could just use with groups. Well, for example, the um, the meme activity where we had them come up with a, a meme that would um, respond to um, something in, in the UDL chapter, and they didn't have to do it in any way. They could draw it. They could um, hand draw it and take a picture of it. It, it was the reflection that was the important component of that. Not necessarily right, exactly. the tool. So, there you go. Fantastic. Go ahead, I just keep put going. in. Um, sorry, I just put in the our UDL planning guide. I think maybe that might be closer to what you were thinking about. Um, what we did there was, um, and it, it's one of those resources, Louise. I looked at my. We have a coming soon on the video part there. But what we did was we looked at um, the. It's it's got flexible instructional design, deep inquiry and understanding, and ownership of learning. And what you can do is you can go in and there's all kinds of strategies that you can pick to really, and again, we didn't want to be a checklist, but if you're like, I don't know where to start, it gives you those, and really a lot of them don't, they're more that teaching and the strategies as opposed to technology itself. Um, and so, I mean, I'm big proponent, obviously, of technology, but this actually allows you to look at some other things. Um, just really, you know, encourage students to consider their jagged profile when determining tasks. Like it's really those sorts of things that we tried to do rather than just go find this tool that's going to help learners do X, Y, or, or uh, Z. Oh, those are fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Sue? Yeah, so we have one, one question um, that came out of the chat. I, I really appreciate, um, Kendra and Luis, your focus on um, uh, allowing people really are new teachers to come in and really come in at a place that a, a level of comfort. Um, you know, we're a small uh, field, we're growing, thank goodness, but you know, we tend to um, have experts that we idolize and there's almost a rock star mentality sometimes, you know, in our, in our UDL community. So I really appreciate this notion of that you can come in at any place and really be a part of our community and this inclusiveness. I think that's really something we as a field need to embrace um, uh, more and more of. And, and I, my question connected to that is, what would you tell a novice, what advice would you give to a very novice teacher as they're coming in to and beginning to start um, learning about universal design for learning? Just one or two uh, sentences to share with the group uh, as you're thinking about that brand new teacher diving in or towing in or um, getting started with UDL. I, I would say, um, and I picked this up from Thomas Tobin, is that whole idea of plus one thinking. Mm -hmm. So what's one thing I can do tomorrow? What's one thing I can do next week? Um, the whole goal is to continue moving forward and making your practice, um, improving your practice and having, you know, we're always talking about growth mindset with our learners, right? We should have a growth mindset as well and be focused on continuous improvement. And 
So if you just take that approach of what's one little thing I can do this week, um, I think it becomes a habit, right? Something you do once and then you do it a few more times, then slowly becomes part of your routine. And then it becomes a habit that you don't even have to think about. Um, it's sort of automatic in a way. Um, so that's the kind of thing that I would say is just kind of start with one simple step and then build on it. And over time, uh, yeah, your practice is going to see, you're going to start to see your practice develop into something different. And that's going to motivate you as well to continue to want to do uh, these things that we've been talking about. I love that. That's wonderful. And, and, you know, then adding that reflection piece into it too, right? Thinking yep. back about the growth that I've come across over the course of a week or two weeks or a month or a year really can be super powerful. Um, I, I'd like to jump in with just the, the one tip or the one thing I would say to that brand new teacher is talk to your students, talk to the kids in your classroom and ask them, how do they want to show what they know and give, give them an opportunity to, to let you know what, what options are available and what they're interested in doing. Yeah, I like that. I think teaching them about UDL and um, for me, I've always been, you know, we all have a jagged profile. So, you know, sharing that with learners and being vulnerable. Um, probably I always say, you, that, you know, if you're an educator, you probably went to school well, you know, you colored in the lines and you put it, brought your assignments in on time. Not all of us, those who end up in special ed usually didn't, but, um, you know, it tends to be. And so it's really stepping back and looking at, at that piece of, you know, what is my jagged profile? And I think the other piece is we don't always have to just uh, zone in on strategies, of instructional strategies. Could be your classroom. We actually did a, a webinar uh, last uh, year with ISTE on you know, your, your environment and having learners build the classroom environment all the way from the, the social environment and the physical environment. So it might be a place to, that's more comfortable for you to start there rather than, oh, I have to change all my instructional practices. Um, but I think that's a, another way that you can get the learner involved in building their own classroom and, and making it this really great place for all learners. Um, I, I love that too, Kendra. I only saying that I know we have a lot of, of teachers who are struggling with thinking about uh, changing lesson design um, because it feels really overwhelming and you spend a lot of time to do it for one day to finish and go, okay, that was great. And now I have to do it all over again. And sometimes starting with that environment piece, a change, one change that you can make that, that will um, continue or can continue across time, um, carries over day to day, uh, feels a little less threatening. I wondered, um, Tom, since you are, um, you know, so close to the classroom, if you have any other uh, piece of advice for teachers who are just beginning to to think about trying on UDL in their classroom. Uh, go slow and be comfortable. I think something we did this year that I think was really helpful um, is we used the UDL progression rubric and um, the one created, I think we used one by Katie Novak and Kristen Rodriguez. And we had teachers assess themselves on there and then we identified one column or one row that they would move to the right. So just one, one step at a time. So we really want to be able to move it one step, build momentum, um, celebrate successes, and then move on. We, last year, we left it a little more open, and we found it was a little overwhelming for people. So the focus for us is one step, kind of like the plus one thinking that Luis was talking about. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And using that, that rubric as a, as a way to help um, teachers choose something that's an area that's really relevant to them and, and have a, a vision for what that will look like moving forward. Yeah, exactly. Nice. Very nice. All right. Um, well, we are, we're a few minutes over our time tonight. Uh, so before we wrap up, I just want to, I want to thank everyone. To, um, thank you so, so much for being here this evening. Uh, for, for giving of your time and your expertise and um, knowledge and experience. Um, if you are um, looking for additional learning around UDL and networking with some um, amazing experts in our fields, 
um, come join us. The, the um, great, the UDLIRN is hold, hosting their second um, Great Lakes Regional event here in Michigan. Uh, so fall in Michigan is beautiful. Come see us November 12th and 13th. It'll be at Macomb ISD. Um, we'll have David Reed and Allison Posey and our very own Brian Dean will be there. Our, our, uh, our what is it again, Brian? Futurist. <laughs> I lost space it. futurist, space futurist. So, but I'm not talking about space at all. No, no, but I no, think, I not. think what brought up the space futurist is everybody saw my galaxy suit last year at the IRN and they were like, that's what makes sense. Yes, that was it. <laughs> but, um, really it's, this is an, an excellent event. Um, you can come for one day or come for both and, um, get some learning, have some time to network with some experts in the field with other UDL enthusiasts within from our area and um and build a plan for implementation um and then of course after you get your feet wet in that you can really dive in here following uh in the in the model of kendra and lisa's footsteps here um at the udl iron our national summit which will take place um in march in orlando so always a beautiful time to get away from snow if you're up from our area from Michigan or up in, in Ontario. So, uh, but, or any, if you're traveling from anywhere else as well. And this is really um, an amazing event. Um, I've had an opportunity to, to attend the past, um, well, gosh, four or five years. And it just gets better and better every time. Um, tons of national experts. This is real, um, in the trenches, uh, learning around the research behind universal design for learning and the implementation science that goes along with it. Um, there's a little bit of what is it for people who are new and a lot of really deeper dives for people who have been deep in, in the work and, um, and really want to, to deepen and expand their, their implementation and ability to lead learning in others. So uh, a great, great event. Um, and then, and to follow up on one of those, the uh, um, professional learning plugs from Helen was talking about, I think, the Twitter slow chat as, a, as an alternative way to engage. We've got that too. The UDL chat happens um, the first and third Wednesday of the month. And Brian, what time do those, are those taking place? Eight? Yeah. Those are uh, nine to nine thirty, folks. Nine, nine to nine thirty. We Thanks. usually send out. We usually tweet out a uh, a list of the questions beforehand so that you can kind of get your answers ready because it is it is rapid fire and it is <laughs> always firing on all cylinders. So um, it's the fastest half hour on the internet. Ooh, it goes so fast. It goes so fast. So. But lots yeah. of great ideas flying out of that. So you mm -hmm. come and and join in. Come and watch. Come, come and. Um, and take away some some great some great learning and dialogue from that as well. Um, so again, uh, a huge thanks to all of our panelists. I'm just gonna pop out here. I'll stop my share and come out here so we can um, thank everyone for joining us this evening. Um, again, if you didn't catch the whole thing, if you missed the beginning or you had to sign off early and you missed the end, you can catch us on the uh, our live stream. Will be. Uh, that this will all have been recorded and we'll be getting that link out uh, soon. And any final thoughts from anybody on our panel or on our team tonight? Just thank you very much for inviting us. It was uh, great to see some people I haven't seen in a while and meet some new people. And thanks for the opportunity for sharing. Excellent. Thank you thank very you. much. If Absolutely. you have not gotten this book yet, you need to go out, treat yourself. You deserve it. You need it. Put it in your life. Put it in your life, y'all. And we will be doing another book uh, study with it coming up. It, stay tuned. Stay Excellent. tuned. Excellent. We'll be definitely looking for looking for that to come out. Very good. All right. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us tonight. Yeah. We look forward to seeing you soon in the future. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye-bye. Good night, everybody.